You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chris, and in this episode, we'll try to figure out what the hell a horror film actually is. Does it have to be scary? And uh, if not, is it a failure? I I had the pleasure of being joined by two of the biggest horror fans I know. Lauren, who is the creator of They Shoot Zombies. That's pretty much the most comprehensive attempt at an all-time greatest horror films list I I have ever seen. And Saul, who has on at least more than one occasion mentioned that he has uh, seen more than 2,000 horror films as listed on IMDb. And uh, to balance things out, we also managed to lure in our co-host Matthew, who says he's not a horror junkie, though he did go to Fright Fest once, which, to be honest, uh, puts him one over uh, on me anyways. So there you have it, two hardcore horror fanatics, someone stuck in between, and then me, somewhere there on the, the edges. Well, this could uh, quickly uh, turn into a five-minute episode, if everyone just agrees scary movies are scary movies. I I think it would be pretty fun to just explore the gray areas a bit and just pick my co-host's brain about just how extreme they are on the horror purist scale, what they think qualify, what doesn't, and what kind of emphasis they place on fear-inducing terror. I'll even see if I can spark some controversy here by getting them to denounce horror classics as fake horror. Will I succeed? Uh, Oh, and then we'll also try to figure out where that magical border between horror and thriller actually goes. So uh, let's get straight into it here. And uh, since it's a horror episode, we can turn things on its head and start in reverse alphabetical horror. Sorry, uh, reverse alphabetical order and start with Saul here. What is it that makes a film into a horror movie? So, would you say that every film that scares you automatically qualifies, or are there other factors in play? Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'd say the scare fact um, is probably the most obvious defining feature of a horror movie, but I don't know if that alone qualifies a film as being horror. I guess anything which dreads up a lot of anxiety and dread has got, like, horror elements to it. And I know when The Father came out, the Anthony Hopkins film, I was trying to tell everybody in the Best of 2020 podcast that it was a horror film because it's about this guy who is so scared of everything and all these strange people that keep popping up in his apartment. I'm not quite sure what the definition of horror is. It's a bit of a tricky one because when you think about horror and the universal horror classics, you think about things like Dracula, vampires, you think about things like Frankenstein, the Wolfman, but a lot of those characters by themselves aren't necessarily horror. If you think about something like the Addams Family, that doesn't really feel like horror, it's more like fantasy, it doesn't really involve people being scared or drumming up fear, but they're not every, not every single horror movie necessarily needs to be scary. I guess I'm not quite sure exactly myself the definition of horror. Probably the only thing I can say for sure is if there's a film that's tagged as being horror, there's probably more chance of it appealing to my sensibilities than a film that's just tagged as being a drama or just tagged as being a comedy. So for me, I guess the classification of something as a horror usually indicates that it'll be up my alleyway. I don't know what the definition of horror necessarily is, but I just know that it sort of appeals to me as a viewer. You just like to say the word, essentially. It's just like, as long as that label is there, you get excited. <laughs> uh, what about uh, you, Matt? Uh, like, would you qualify any movie that scares you as horror? No, I, d- I don't think so. So I've tried to, uh, I've tried to move away from the idea of, you know, that emotional response of, of being scared. And I, I mean, I think part of the reason is that, you know, a lot of people I know who enjoy horror movies, they're not actually scared by the movie. Well, it feels to me, at least, that they're turning up to, to get something different out, out of the experience. In some ways, you know, a lot of horror fans to me seem to be enjoying something on a meta level. 
they're enjoying something plays with convention and you does seem to be a genre where there's a lot of convention but i think like if we actually look at what my definition is it might be i don't know if it would be defined as wider or narrower than a usual definition but i the, the way I've chosen to define it usually is that it's a sort of like a net loss story. So if you take an inventory of all the sort of people and dreams that are alive at the start, by the end, there are dreams that are dead and that there are people that are, are dead. It's a net loss story. And I kind of look at it as two sides of a coin. There's a sort of German word, Bildung. Is often used in the context of novels that where there's a lot of drama, but that they're really about managing to move your life forward and grow as people. Very positive stories, and to, to me, horror is the side of that. So, I think if you like, just think about any sort of horror movie, like a slasher loose in a sorority house. That guy, it's always, almost always going to be a guy, right? It is going to kill a lot of people, even if you catch the killer by the end you've still got a tragedy on your hands that, you know, I often call movies that other people don't call movies horror. And I think I often see sci-fi as horrific. And I think actually, luckily and completely by chance, I saw all of Don Hertzfeld's World of Tomorrow this previous week. And I think if you go on IMDb and you look at the sort of list of you know, genres that's associated with his movies. <laughs> Almost every single genre is is tagged except for horror. But and and yet I do find that they're horror movies. So to me, like in in this idea of a sort of net loss story, with sci-fi, the biggest possible net loss is available. You know, you might have we're all sat here enjoying recording a podcast. M- maybe at some point, someone from the future just decides to go to time travel and, and changes the timeline and w- we don't exist anymore. And, you know, this this never happened. And I think that's rather sad. And you might have a situation where a whole planet is destroyed or half of reality. So I often find like sci-fi to be in- intensely horrific. And I think, you know, in the world of tomorrow movies, you have this ability to travel in between moments in time, you know, times like quantized and someone can just walk up behind you and kill you and make it look like an accident. And there's nothing really that you can, can do about that. Yeah, I think all of Don Hertzfeld's films are horror films and the screening that I went to was announced as a sort of like an evening with Don Hertzfeld, and there's a special introduction for it, which is just him sort of trapped in this horrible sort of Martian looking landscape where he's he's got a spade and he's just tunneling through rock We're in a sort of prison that there's no way out. So yeah, I would see all of Don Hertzfeld's movies as, as horror, essentially. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think the existential horror label would... <laughs> definitely uh, fit and uh, I think existential horror can also cut a bit closer to our core instead of in terms of actual fear and dread uh, as well. Uh, what about uh, you Lauren? Uh, would you say that fear and uh, being scared etc is, is what makes film horror to you and how, how do you feel about existential horror in general? Uh, I might just jump in. Um... Not only because Lauren wants to procrastinate speaking, but just on Matt's point there about genres, I think it's not just horror. I think pretty much every genre, you really see a film that's just one genre. Usually it's a mix of something else, so I don't think it's limited to horror. I think it goes for all genres. And the other thing which you had mentioned about sci-fi, sci-fi, fantasy and horror are often combined together. And you get films that are talked about as being genre films, like what from one of those three genres. So I think there's a lot of overlap in there. But I guess the concept of a genre itself is maybe a subject for another podcast. But it is kind of interesting the way that we've evolved after um what are we, about a hundred and ten years of narrative feature length cinema. We've got to the point where we're used to seeing a film classified as one genre or another, but it's not necessarily inherent to a film itself that it needs to be one thing. It's probably almost always going to be a combination of different elements. But anyway, I will stop droning on so that Lauren actually can jump in. Yeah, so I don't have a like really easy definition of horror. I find it really hard to define it. One, one of the reasons that horror is my favourite genre is that it can kind of be anything. 
there's such a variety of types of horror that it's hard to define it into just a really simple sentence. Although I liked what Matt said about uh, it being like uh, about loss. So I hadn't really thought about it like that. So I thought that was uh, an interesting way to look at it. But one thing that I think is like a link within all horror films, like I don't think being scary is what makes a horror film. I think that's a type of horror film and I don't really get scared by them. So that's not something that I'm looking for. But I think one thing that links all horror films together is that it's um, looking at some kind of darkness or a dark element, but not necessarily in a scary or dark way. So you can have kids horror, which might deal with something about death or loss or something like that but in a, a lighter way or in a funny way. I mean, I don't think the intention of horror has to be that it's to be scary. It just needs to deal with something dark. It's interesting what Lauren says about not being fr- frightened by the movies, because that, that's something that I tend to see a lot. I went to see a horror movie recently. Uh, I've temporarily forgotten the name. It's a really famous horror movie that's contemporarily famous horror movie that, that everyone's g- going to see. I was kind of like horrified by it. I thought, you know, this is this awful movie, you know, awful things are happening, you know, it's sort of dread for me. But almost everyone else in the audience was laughing throughout, you, you know, they were seeing all this sort of stuff that was happening as a joke. And, you know, the reason I wanted to mention this is I think, you know, over time, type of audience for horror, horror has changed a lot. There used to a lot more be people who, who were going because they absolutely wanted to be terrified. And that became much less of a thing, you know, I sort of started talking to someone about horror movie and they don't even want to hear what, what I'm going to say about the horror movie because it would terrify them. And that, then they don't go to see horror movies at the cinema because they would be terrified and they absolutely don't want to feel that way. Whereas I think a lot of people used to go because they wanted to, to be terrified. And I think there was a whole dynamic that you used to see where people used to go to a horror movie as, as a date because the person you're with is terrified it gives you it gives you an opportunity to put your arm around them or, or, or something like that so i do think what h- horror is and particularly what, what the audience is seem, does seem to have changed a lot that's a good point i mean horrors used to be pretty big blockbusters i'm not sure how well horror movies are doing at the box office today there's there's been a couple of exceptions uh, the last uh, few years, but usually uh, they're not at the top of that uh, box office list anymore. So something has definitely happened. But then again, even comedy, even the comedy blockbuster got pushed out mostly. Like there used to be drama blockbusters well into the 2000s. Now they're hardly seen. When obviously it was Oppenheimer uh, last year, but it's very, very, very rare to see a dramatic uh, blockbuster. So Horror was one of the victims, and probably one of the earlier victims there. And uh, just that change in viewer habits, like you said, I mean, that, that could very easily be it, that people used to go to uh, the movies to be scared, and now they don't want to be scared anymore. I wonder what caused that. That would be really interesting to explore. We should get some uh, sociologists and anthropologists uh, running around the cities uh, right now asking questions, because I think you raised uh, some very interesting points about the societal change there. Well, I think it's interesting as well as when you, when you first hear about the, the movies in, in the 19th century, I've forgotten the exact the name of the, the movie, but it, the, there's this bit where the cowboy draws his pistol and fires, uh, but he does it at the audience. And at the time, he, people you know, were struggling to distinguish reality from screen reality, and people were genuinely sort of running out of the theatre because they thought some, someone was shooting at them. That's not really the the way we actually engage with material a- anymore. You know, I think that we're all sort of exposed to, to media at a much earlier age. So I, I definitely did go through a period where I found horror movies absolutely terrifying. And so, f- for for example, like one of the things that very different for me is that my mum took a very liberal attitude to letting me watch horror movies. So I had seen all of the new release ho- horror when, when I was a kid that none of the other children at school had seen at all. And I mean, I remember, for example, watching Pet Cemetery and having to hide behind the sofa, like literally, and just li- literally peeking out, you know, it's almost like something from a novel, but that's I really was thinking this is, I don't know how I'm going to be able to finish this movie. When I was a child, that Killer Clown movie was definitely going on. I 
I was absolutely sort of traumatized by, by movies <laughs> and I was watching them from behind the sofa. And I think, you know, I know that that can't happen anymore. No matter what someone is showing, there is no way that I'm going to be wanting to hide by the sofa anymore. So sometimes I think that maybe sort of horror is my favorite genre. And, you you know, I don't want to sort of ruin the memories by being the movies anymore because I, I know that they just don't have that peak effect on me that they would have. And I think I always find it very funny the horror movies had these certifications on them saying, oh, you, you need to be sort of 18. So I'm talking from a UK perspective. You, you know, you have to be 18 to go and watch this movie. I thought, well, that this movie won't have an effect on you if you watch it after the age of 18. So I always used to find that quite perverse. And the thing is that when you are a child, that you have way less control over your life. People control what you eat when you go to bed. I always find like a gym lesson at school sort of terrifying. You know, I had a colleague sort of talking in a negative way about children and how they make such a fuss the time we were we were having lunch on a boat and i said well look you know we're having this nice lunch on a boat the child might be going into a pe lesson and being told to do five somersaults would you like to be t- told to do a bunch of somersault at the moment as a child as well you're also like particularly vulnerable you know you don't understand how people operate and you you've got l- less sort of physical presence so being a child in some way has an element of horror to it and i always found like horror intensely more interesting when i was a child as an adult it means that i'm a lot more likely to be watching something that would classify as an existential horror because i I can still get worried to a degree about the nature of life itself i don't know if anyone else has the early experiences like the first time that they watched a horror movie and were you sort of t- terrified by early experiences i mean your childhood sounds very similar to mine in a way i mean i don't think i hid behind the couch but uh, i do remember watching killer clowns uh, from outer space on the probably showtime or one of those cable channels i remember watching all of the friday the 13th uh, movies <laughs> like all in the same uh, like early teens era Definitely being being a bit uh, scared, definitely being very, very into horror as, as a teenager and borderline teenager. <laughs> so yeah, very, very similar. They're mostly the same movies as well that uh, had some, some kind of mark. But were you worried that Freddy was to get you in your dreams? Not Freddy, no. I don't think I was ever worried about Freddy. I don't remember what films genuinely scared me as a, as a child. Jaws probably had more effect than a lot of them. I'm trying to think, I don't remember anything any that actually traumatized me, but uh, I mean, I do recall, you know, after I would watch a movie that I would be, you know, a little bit worried about what could be on my bed, etc. As, uh, uh, as a child, but that's that's the first, like, that's the most I can remember. I can't remember actually a specific film horrifying me or being worried about a specific killer. I don't think that happened. I don't remember being terrified by any horror movies as a child. But I do remember, like, my horizons being expanded and sort of, like, testing my imagination of what could be possible. Like, one of my earliest horror experiences was Poltergeist 3. I saw it before Poltergeist 1 or 2. I would have been maybe 9 or 10 years old. I think I was staying at a hotel somewhere and just happened to be on TV. And Poltergeist 3 has got this amazing element of people in a mirror world that's different from your world and it's sort of like they're able to like pull you into the mirror and your reflection's not quite what you are so you've sort of got those two realities going on there and that didn't scare me but it really challenged me intellectually and i like thought about that for i guess months and years afterwards and i've rewatched the film a couple of times since and to me it's just still that um, an, an amazing concept and I guess similarly with Nightmare on Elm Street, I would have been a little bit older, but I was probably about 12 or 13 when I first saw it. And for me, it was just that whole concept of the fact that you could be killed in a dream or that somebody in a dream could be like coming in to attack and kill you, which was interesting for me and it really stimulated me, but it didn't really scare me. I'm not really scared easily going to the point that you made Matt and the point that Lauren said also about not really easily being scared. I don't really watch horror movies to be scared. I watch horror movies for my, I guess, horizons to be expanded. Like what Lauren said, horror movies can be anything. And I guess that's what I like about horror, sci-fi, fantasy, genre films in general, 
that they can be so many different things. It's not like a prison drama where you only have like three or four different possible stories. There's so much infinite possibilities that exist with horror. And I guess that's my impressions of it as a child. The first horror films that I saw made me really think about what narratives in general could be, not necessarily horror, just narratives, what stories can be in general, what ideas could exist out there. That's really interesting because I've been working putting together a list of my favourite sci-fi recently and uh, the title I chose for the list was Stories Without Boundaries. So it sounds like there's a huge overlap here between what what horror and sci-fi bring, bring to the table because I mean that's the exact definition that, that you've just used and you've described it for the, for the entire complex I guess. So I think it's interesting that we've been talking about what horror is for about half an hour now. And we have a couple of loose definitions here. Uh, one is that they're about loss. Another is that they can be pretty much anything. So uh, I don't feel like we haven't gotten close to the core, except that, you know, they, they might uh, not be as effective as we get older. Uh, I, I did look at a couple of definitions before this episode. Uh, so, so it might just be interesting to see if we agree or disagree with them. So I'll read three really quick ones. Uh, the first one is from uh, Cambridge. And it says, uh, a horror film is a film in which very frightening or unnatural things happen. For example, dead people coming to life and people being murdered. All right. I think people at Cambridge are just very big zombie fans from what I can hear. That's, uh, <laughs> that's just, like, specifically unnatural, frightening or unnatural. So I guess that would include all uh, fantasy films as well. It's a, it's a very, very odd, odd definition. Uh, and then you have Britannica, which says horror film, a motion picture calculated to cause intense repugnance, fear or dread. Ooh, so there we also have repugnance. And uh, Finally, Wikipedia, which says horror is a film genre that seeks to elicit fear or disgust for entertainment purposes. I, I like repugnance, you, you know. Yes, like, that's an interesting one. Yeah. The movie that I watched, I remember the name of it now is Speak No Evil. Well, it's a movie by James Watkins, but I was, I was about to say it's a James McAvoy movie because that's a reason that a lot of people have gone to see it because they just think that he's, he's such an amazing guy. But, you know, I watched it and that's what I got from it was repugnance. Some really terrible things were happening that I thought were so terrible that, like, why, why would you even want to fill people's minds with, with this? But I do think, going back to this point, that, a lot of people aren't going to be repulsed and that they're not going to, to be scared. So like some of those definitions you, you just mentioned sound like old definitions and that, you know, maybe in some some sort of way we've moved on from how, how we interact with these types of movies. I did also write some something down that was a reserve definition of, of horror. Basically, a horror movie is a movie where I'm being manipulated, but I'm happy about it. I might just chime in on the subject of definitions because Chris went to all these big universities and institutes for definitions. I'm just going to the IMDb definition. Not that I really trust or like IMDb much these days, but it's still the biggest internet database of movies, even though they do absolutely nothing for their core base users. So the original definition that they had, because they've got genre definitions, because when somebody, yeah, I am going to make a diss to IMDb whenever I can, Lauren. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the fact is that um, IMDb need to have genre definitions because people submit movies to IMDb and people often change the genres on there from time to time just to stuff around with the I check movies lists. No, it's not just for that reason but they need to have definitions in there. And there was an old definition they used to have, which was that a horror film is a film that has multiple scenes in there of people being scared or people or a person being scared. That definition has actually changed over time. So I just looked at their 2024 definition guideline, which is should contain numerous consecutive scenes of characters affecting a terrifying and or repugnant narrative throughout the title. Note, not to be confused with thriller, which is usually based, which is usually not based in fear or abhorrence. So 
that's a bit of a I guess a vaguer definition of horror it is kind of interesting that they talk about not only numerous but consecutive because yeah i'm not sure i'd even agree with that that horror needs to have consecutive scenes that are terrifying or repugnant they just need to be in there but yeah anyway i just thought that was an interesting thing to throw into the mix nobody can really properly say what horror is i'm gonna say it's probably the same with most genres i mean you've got a rough idea of what something is but you know, one person's definition of, like, even an action film is different from another person's. Like, Howard Lloyd comedies are listed as action films on IMDb, where, but there's, like, no fighting in there or anything. It's just because there's a lot of running and scurrying about the whole time. They're, de they're defined as being action. So I think with pretty much every genre, like, this episode's called, like, What is a Horror Film?, I'd say pretty much any genre, there's tons of room to debate. You know, when I first uh, read the IDB definition, when, when you shared it in the chat, I just laughed because uh, it, it sounded so, so silly. But thinking about it, I, I can kind of understand like the instructive matter of it. It's like, here's something that's almost scientific. It's almost like this is something that has to be in the film. And it, it, it does, in a way, make sense, even though it sounds silly, because in, in horror films, people are usually scared or they die. There's usually a killer, someone's being chased, and essentially just, I have to be trying to figure out a way to disconnect all of the different genres, be it a shark or an alien or uh, even existential dread, and it's just, just like, are people scared here? It's possible to find a horror film where people are never scared or there aren't consecutive scenes where people are scared. I don't really think so. So maybe they stumbled onto something secretly genius here and cracked the code. I think the problem with the definition is what it leaves out. So I would agree that every single movie that has these consecutive frightening scenes, those are all horror movies. I would just say it's, it's just left a, a, a ton out. So I just find it a very restrictive de definition, but it does have the merit of a, at least every movie that falls within its definition would definitely be a horror. And I, I noticed in the chat that you said all, that all movies are manipulative. I, I don't know if you, you wanted to, to expand on that. Uh, I mean, I guess I just think all, all movies are trying to do something to you. And I think it's just a matter of whether it works for us or if it doesn't. And if it doesn't, we can generally see through the manipulation. But if it does, we either don't see it or we just accept it. Like you said, do you like being manipulated by horror or you like are open to it with horror? But I, I kind of feel like every movie is just as manipulative. So. One reason I take issue with that is I guess that like either experimental or art house movies that i watch i think everyone's getting something different different out of those movies and that that's kind of what i can admire about a movie if it if it really allows you to come to your own beautiful thoughts well i kind of think all films do do that because uh i mean even i've had discussions on the forum about certain films where like people like you know just a basic film really but people will come away with two completely different perspectives on something I agree with experimental cinema, it's a little bit of a fuzzy area, but even then, if you read like people's interpretations, they're, they're usually really based on the like uh, the technical qualities of it more than like interpretation necessarily, it's more about the uh, use of film or the shot or like other things that aren't important to me in a film, <laughs> but I still think any piece of art has the ability to manipulate because otherwise nobody would get anything out of any of them i don't know some, something stupid on social media of someone asking a, a young girl if they um heard of the titanic and she was like oh i haven't seen that film yet it's like the actual <laughs> real titanic she didn't even like that didn't cross her mind so i think that um like you know someone's gonna watch titanic and see like a romance film and someone else is gonna see a depiction of a real event and another person is gonna see a cool boat sinking movie and another person is just going to be like bored to death because they think it's um, manipulative trash or whatever. So I think from something like Titanic, you still get multiple reactions and reflections. I think we could probably do a full episode on uh, manipulation in uh, cinemas. And maybe you should schedule that in because it sounds like people are getting really, 
really excited and worked up about talking about this uh, topic and uh, I feel like I have a lot to say and bicker about too so maybe this is a nice little warm-up to get back uh, onto the topic IMDB did try to kind of figure out is there something that all horror films have in common and uh, I, I think it would be interesting to see if you guys can find anything else that all horror films have in common or, or perhaps even a common intent. I mean, to you, is there anything all horror films should strive for or, or do strive for? I think I've already said the sort of net loss thing. To me, that is something that they all have. Whether there might be sort of other movies that are also net loss but people wouldn't accept as horror, I don't know. So, I mean, I was thinking about war movies, for example. War is when humans decide to go the sort of net loss route I do see practically every war movie as a horror movie, whereas I don't know if everyone else thinks that. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that I don't think there's something that necessarily binds all horror films together. I think that's the best thing about the genre. Uh, Compared to other genres like a Western or a war movie, I think there's certain things in there that you expect, or the example we gave before is a prison genre, uh, the prison drama, because that's a very limited genre. So I just think with horror, because it's so all-encompassing and it's so many different possible avenues, I don't think there's necessarily anything that horror films have in common, other than the fact that people watch them and go that felt to me like a horror movie so i think that's their combining factor the way that people react to them rather than the way the films themselves are made and no i do not think that all war movies are horror movies Uh, i do not think that duck soup is a horror film for instance i have forgot duck soup was a horror movie Yeah, I, I, I guess, like, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to say, like, all comedy is horror, but I think I watched the YouTube video yesterday that was suggesting that there was something dark behind comedy, you know, the author of the YouTube video was basically suggesting that, you know, comedy is this thing that people do instead of interacting with you, so they, they kind of create an alternative personality. You've asked them a question and you're interacting with them, and instead of them sort of introducing you to them, they they create this completely sort of shell personality that then sort of says something that doesn't really answer your question. You know, it's just designed to, to make you laugh and sort of pop you off. And the guy was suggesting that behind every comedian that, that there's the darkness. I'm trying not to sort of stretch, stretch the, the definition of horror so that it encompasses everything, but... Kind of sounds like you are. I'm, I mean, I do think it stretches to, to encompass a, a lot of stuff. You know, I do think comedy is quite dark. I think the Marx Brothers are, are, are quite dark. You know, what's that famous phrase of Groucho's? He doesn't want to belong to any club that would have him. You know, that's that's an existential horror statement for me. But La- Lauren has written in the chat that um, she hates it when people call, call war movies horror. So I don't know if you'd... I'm quite happy to be on the re- receiving end on Smackdowns with this stuff, you know, because I think pr- probably most people wouldn't accept that war movies were, were horror movies. Oh, Lauren, I'm calling you out a bit. <laughs> uh, well, I understand why people sometimes chuck them in there, especially like Come and See and um, stuff like that. But um, it just annoys me because it's like it's a, it's a different kind of intention to a horror film so kind of like it's horrific but it's not horror (laughs) um so it's kind of just uh something that like bothers me or like people who call like wizard of oz a horror film because there's a witch in it and stuff like that i just uh, a horror element or a horrific element is not a horror film I think that's very interesting, like, because I think that the subject of intention, like, you said two things that were interesting for me. I think the subject of intention is really interesting because obviously a lot of war movies, particularly sort of back in the day, were intended to highlight heroism, which, you, you know, people were suggesting was a positive concept. I think there's a movie called The Americanization of Emily that really takes that imagery to task, you, you know, that we should celebrate heroism in war and things like that. So I, I guess I agree with you that I don't think the intention of most war movies is to be horror movies, but I am someone that often will ig- ignore the intention of, of, of the filmmakers if, you know, I think there's a, a, a something better that I can get out of the movie. It's interesting when you talk about Oz I haven't read the books, but from 
what I read about them, the books are actually horror, and a lot of people were annoyed with The Wizard of Oz because it, it kind of removed the horror element from 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 the books, which, which of course, is like a film is perfectly entitled to, you, you know, riff on, on stuff and take, take things in different directions, you know, like, you know, we had a conversation in, in chat recently about the, the Shining and you know, The Shining isn't really what Stephen King in, intended but it, it's still a great movie at least to me. I think the Oz leads me to, to talk about the sequel, The Return of Oz because actually I think I tried to sort of pick out a few horror movies in advance of doing this podcast that I thought these are the sort of amazing horror movies that I, I hold in exceptionally high regard and one of them is The Return of uh, to Oz, which I think is a movie that is very deliberately calculated to re- return the concept back to horror. Um, I think there, there were kind of two things in, in that movie that, you know, two general sort of threads of com- complete horror. So I think the start of the, the movie, the, the idea is that Doc Dorothy is going to be subjected to electrotherapy because the, the stuff that she's saying about where she's been and what she's been doing means that she must be crazy. And I think that that was a genuine sort of fear that I've always had, that people will just not believe anything that I say. You know, I, I've seen something absolutely terrifying and hor- horrendous. I've, I've seen the dark side of someone, you know, I've seen them doing something, but I was the, the sole, sole witness. And then I go and tell everyone and you know, they tell me that I'm sort of making it up or insane. That idea that you're the, the ultimate sort of refutation of something you say is that, you know, some, someone's going to take you and sort of subject you to electroshock therapy. I think there's another bit in it. You know, there's a sort of witch called Mombi who has gone and literally decapitated a large proportion of the lady gentry of, of Oz and she, he has the head stored in a room with just something that I just looked at and thought, how can somebody be that cruel? And I think it's another th- thing for horror movies that they can explore the, the, the depth of people's cruelty, I guess. So I'm, I may have taken us sl- slightly off, off track there. I don't know if anyone you know, wants to, to go back to sort of bits of where we're talking about. Yeah, I think when you look at war films and you look at Wizard of Oz, etc., I think that uh, this uh, this definition of IMDb just keeps coming back to my mind where people are kind of thinking of one thing uh, of what probably is in every horror and it can pretty much be applied uh, in so many other places too because I, I, there are several uh, scenes of people being scared in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, certainly in pretty much every single war movie there will be consecutive scenes of people uh, being scared, especially like if you look back at all of the uh, World War One movies where people are hiding in the ditches, uh, just clutching the rifles. Like, there's so many scenes of that. And uh, if you're kind of going on a more checklist basis to figure out what the hell horror is, that would qualify probably. Like, like uh, Laura mentioned too, like Wizard of Oz uh, has witches. Check. Witches belong to horror. Check. That is a horror film. Uh, but it, it's not really like that. And I, I do agree that intent doesn't necessarily fully matter. But when it comes to genre, like, uh, I- intent is usually a pretty big part. I mean, you can mess something up so much that it becomes an accidental comedy, for instance. And yes, I mean, you can make a drama and it can be accidentally in a good way, uh, scary and unnerving to the point that some people would qualify it as a horror movie. But, uh, generally speaking, uh, like you do follow certain genre lines when you create films, especially commercial films. And like it, it, it's everything from the music choices you use to how you uh, shoot the film, the color filters, everything about it. I mean, uh, if you look, at, if you take a scene of someone uh, picking up their keys. Like, just from that alone, you can tell you're in a horror movie. I mean, look at something like uh, Midsommar, for instance. I think there's like 30 plus minutes before we, the actual horror side of the story starts developing properly, even though there are some uh, unnerving scenes early on. And you can just tell from the soundscape, this is meant to be unnerving. This is something unsettling, like just keys dropping, and you get this more hollow sound, for instance. That there's so many things in just how a film is designed visually and the soundscape that kind of sets the tone of 
what tundra is this and how are you meant to feel when you're watching this movie and to just focus in on war films because i think your, your point that they're all horror films that's something i fundamentally disagree with and that's almost to their detriment because my issue with war films uh, very often is that there should be more horror war movies or maybe uh, most of them should be like they, it's almost like they're missing the point a little bit it, it ties back to that old quote that there are no anti-war movies and i, I do think that is false because you do have a few films like, for instance, uh, Come and See. I, I would actually qualify that as a horror movie that absolutely puts in the sense of utter, utter dread at uh, what war is and what war can be. And you also have some other examples of uh, war films that rather than dread bring in melancholy, uh, sadness. It's, it's a tragedy. But the majority of war films, especially traditional war films, they just really, really, really ramp up a sense of excitement like usually if you open up uh like one of those war films you're actually in the war zones not one of the war dramas you will usually see thriller listed for instance as an additional one and that is because the majority of war films are essentially thrillers they're exciting like they're in the borderline action territory they're like westerns like westerns could also be horror in a way there's like if you watch almost any uh, western you have scenes where people are terrified you know you have raiders coming in you have bandits coming in you have indians coming in or the like cattle bears whipping people uh you have fear and then you have gun violence etc and there's a lot of suspense and uh, i think the uh, feel of war movies generally was awesome we're gonna see shooting we're gonna see explosions it, it's just gonna be badass and it, it's essentially the same same set of things that draw people to westerns it's essentially the same thing that drew a lot of people to uh, action movies and, and that's like this kind of o overlapping thing of what uh, war movies usually are usually designed to do and usually elicit in people but i do think that War movies are perfect landscape for horror, or at least perfect landscape for doing something much more darker, much more fear-inducing that could be really, really exciting. I just don't think uh, the majority of war films go there at all, and it's a uh, it, it's a shame because th the potential really, really is there, and it could let the uh, horror of war sink in. So this wouldn't just be horrifying and uh, emotionally engaging in in a horrific way, but it would also have <laughs> you know some absolutely good. Uh, and probably apt and accurate messaging about what war truly is. Chris, I, I think you used that true true foe quote. You know, there's no such movie as an anti-war movie. You know, I I sort of also just d done it from memory, so it may not be the, the exact quote. I'm not not sure you demonstrated that that, that wasn't true. You no, know, I I do think you know I've never seen a movie that I that plausibly I could describe as an anti-war because I think that's so stimulating. Every anti-war movie I've, I've watched is so stimulating, and people res respond to st stimulating. You know, especially if there's their lives are bored. You know, like I remember you know, my grandfather talking about going off to World War Two, he'd never really been more than a few miles from from the farm, and then you go to this sort of like ultra stimulating environment. Whether it's good or bad stimuli is just sort of secondary to the fact that it's extremely stimulating. So I, that that is a quote from Truffaut that I really like. I, I've never really been able to think of a movie that genuinely anti-war. I, I think you do it, but. You, you couldn't actually use images of war. So I, 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 know, I know exactly, I've got no idea exactly how you would do it, but uh, I, I think it's probably possible, but I'm not sure that anyone has actually ever done it. But I think that... I, I just fundamentally disagree there. I think that you can absolutely use images of war because stimulating is not the same thing as wanting to be there. I think that if you look at uh, those old films from uh, like the 20s, 30s, which were done about World War One and had all these people dancing and so happy and excited they're going to war and you know, we're doing a lot of that in uh, during uh, World War II propaganda films as well. Yes, absolutely. Like you, you, A lot of these films, just, they are stimulating, they're exciting. Like, yes, there's that and all of this stuff, but uh, like there's an excitement there. That's almost every single war movie. But like, the battlefield is not a place of excitement. It is technically a place of fear. So I, I do think that if you take the exact same war scenes, but you just do it from the perspective of soldiers being absolutely terrified, uh, being blown to bits, and if you just change the soundscape, you could very easily do something that would be so repulsive and so scary that people would not want to ever be 
in that situation. I do think Common C uh, managed to largely succeed in that, though it's not really the front lines in the same way. I, I think that the film that does it in the completely opposite way with melancholy would be Fires on the Plane, uh, which is just which is just tragic. <laughs> like there's no one who would want to see Fires on the Plane and think, wow, yeah, I want to be in that scenario. Uh, and so there are these these very 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 few exceptions. Like even something like the bridge, though that that has the excitement level. But then you obviously have children in that position instead, and that just changes how you see that movie completely. Oh, and you can also go the Brechtian route, I guess. I mean, there's that film by Michael Verhoeven called OK, and I realize we're getting off topic completely here from horror. Uh, <laughs> but if you've seen OK, that, that's a film that offended the Americans so much that they actually canceled the Berlinale because they were fighting about whether or not they should be you know, removed from Berlinale or not. Uh, but that, that's just a, that's a film about a group of American soldiers in uh, Vietnam who are bored. They're just sitting there waiting, and they end up uh, raping a Vietnamese girl. And uh, it, it's just like it doesn't actually show any proper fighting. It's it's just awful. I, I should probably get us back to the topic at hand again. But yeah, just uh, maybe we should do an episode on war movies. But then yeah, no, I, I do think there there's different ways to make war movies that does not make war come off as exciting or intriguing or uh, tantalizing. Yeah. So look, after listening to you and Matt discuss whether war films are horror films for the last ten or fifteen minutes, I've come to the point where I've decided the, <laughs> well, I don't know if it is 15 minutes it feels like it's been quite a while the, the whole discussion is making me think more and more that the concept of genres in themselves is ridiculous it's unnatural pigeonholing a great film is a great film we don't need to decide if Vertigo is more of a drama or a romance or a thriller or anything like that it's just a great film so I, I don't think having genres there are necessarily a useful thing I other than uh, for, I guess, more mainstream viewers who want to like know what sort of film they're getting into. But a great film is a great film. I don't think we need to do all this pigeonholing, but it is something for another podcast if we want to discuss whether we need genres or not. So yes, Chris, if you can steer us back on topic. I know we've got a few of the dot points that we want to get through before the end of the episode. <laughs> Thanks on the topic of genre. I mean, I would actually like to, to roll us almost all the way back uh, to the beginning where we talked about how there are almost no movies that are exclusively horror. There's almost always some other genres attached there. And uh, I did go through um, the They Shoot Zombies Don't They list that uh, Lauren curates based on every single affected horror list she can find and uh, looked at some of the top options and there are actually some films very high up there that are only horror and and I realized one more thing too that I've, I've seen prop up a couple of times that IMDb is certainly using all of these alternative genres as well but I, I opened up uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre which is number four on the Day Street Zombies list. And it has six genres tagged, but those genres are B-horror, psychological horror, slasher horror, splatter horror, teen horror, and then finally, as a sixth genre, horror. So, <laughs> I, I did... I did you, you, know, you know what, though, Chris? I, like, to, to me, like, you, you know, I discussed this y years ago with, with Flatmate. Is I, I think the tag that's actually missing there is rural horror. I really think that there are a lot of movies that the intention is to to make you your sort of city dwellers terrified of going to the countryside you know really bad things are gonna yeah so souls just written in the chat backwards horror and it so, souls that are obviously much more knowledgeable on this, this topic than me so pro probably should let him speak about it but yeah apparent, apparently backwards horror is the, is the name of the genre but it's designed to make people worried about going to the countryside you, you know and that it's a place where everyone's sort of backwards and evil and having having sex with relatives and, and that sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, yeah, the third sense is a complete genre. And, and even the number one on Lauren's list, The Exorcist, that's also just tagged as supernatural horror and horror. So uh, there are a lot of films that apparently, at least according to IMDb, 
fits squarely into pure horror. No other uh, genres, though, of course, always subgenres uh, root. So if we remove all of the overlaps, we remove the genre-bending movies, like Saul said, a great movie is a great movie. There's so many films that are 15 genres plus, or at least five genres plus. In terms of horror films that are purely horror, no other adjectives needed. Is there something that ties those films together? I actually think, Chris, that, that like a pure horror movie is something that's pretty rare. No, I'd say there isn't really much in the way of pure horror. Most films are blending multiple genres together at once, even if places like IMDb or Letterboxd just classifies them as one genre. You're really going to find a film that's just going to be one genre, even with the basic horror film. It would usually be a horror slash drama or a horror slash comedy, quite aside from the fact that it might have fantasy or sci-fi or thriller or action elements in there. So, yeah, this this whole genre thing is doing my head, and I just want to obliterate genres altogether. I mean, I sort of do, but then again, if a film gets good reviews on Letterboxd and it is tagged by as horror, that is going to be what piques my interest. So even though I want to get rid of the classifications, films that people identify as horror, that to me is interesting. Uh, well, I, um, I found this quote from uh, Kim Newman that said, um, after the 1930s, the more blurred distinctions become and horror becomes less like a discrete genre than an effect, which can be deployed within any number of narrative settings or narrative patterns. And I kind of feel like from this discussion, I kind of feel like that sort of sums it up pretty well. It's very vague, but um, I think, yeah, horror doesn't fit into things as easily as like a comedy. But even with comedies, which we discussed on another podcast, I think we came to the conclusion that like a comedy can make you laugh, but it can also just be lighthearted and amusing. (laughs) And regarding like pure horror, I I think there's actually like quite a few films that are pure horror, but then it depends on how fussy you are with the definitions of other genres, because If something has a zombie in it, is that then a fantasy because zombies aren't real? And and with, like, They Shoot Zombies, because one of the things that I do is that I give every film one subgenre, which is really hard for some films, and um, I usually go to Rate Your Music and I look up the film and I see what's kind of listed because they they break down subgenres really well. And sometimes horror is the only one listed for some films. So I have to like, uh, even if I've seen a film, sometimes I find it really hard to pick one genre, that subgenre of horror that really sums it up. Uh, And Sol asked what I would say is an example of a pure horror movie. Uh, Well, I would say The Evil Dead, the original, but... Like, I know a lot of people call it a comedy, but I don't see it as a comedy at all. That that whole film is just pure terror from start to finish. But that could also be because of my first... You know, it's not a thriller, it's a horror. It's freaking terrifying, man. That, like, made me cry when I was seven. And uh, it was just everything about it. I don't think it's a thriller at all. I don't see any thriller elements. It's like, that that, that is pure horror to me. Another one would be, like, It Follows... But again, like some people might say that's fantasy, uh, but I don't agree. It's not a drama. Where's the drama? <laughs> there's like no uh, character development. There's barely a narrative. <laughs> it's uh it's a it's a haunting the the film. So yeah, I mean, but that's what I mean. Like my definition of horror or what I feel is a horror is obviously not the same as Souls, because somehow it follows as a a deep psychological character drama in his world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's not deep, but um, I I wouldn't even call it like psychological or whatever. But just um, for me, it does play out like play out like a drama because you're sort of like following this uh one character and how scared she is. So uh, I don't know. Just to me, it sort of plays out like that. But again, I don't know. Carry on. Uh, that makes every film a drama. Well, it is a cool. Yeah, to pretty me. much. I mean, there are some great horror dramas like uh, Let the Right One In, for instance, or The Innocence. Like, I, I think that to be a drama, there actually has to be, uh, like, it, it can't all be about the horror, it can't be all about the chases or the fears. It has to be some kind of, like like you said, Lauren, genuine character development, uh, dialogue, a different kind of pace. Like, it, it can't be, like, I, I would never call The Exorcist drama, for instance, and I do think The Exorcist is a pure horror. I don't think there's any other uh, labels you can throw in there that would fit it. And that's fantasy, of course. That that's like really goes against me because like a couple of the examples as I was going to use as 
horror films that aren't really horror is The Exorcist and The Omen. So I re- yeah, I rewatched The Omen in cinemas last year. It came out um, around Halloween, and people in the audience were chatting throughout it and were like visibly bored, and that's because. It plays out as an investigative drama. There's very little horror in it. I mean, there is the scene where the woman um, jumps off the building and it's like, it's all for you, Damien. And there's a couple of other things, like there's really great uh, killing in there with like glass shattered from the window. But in between it all, it's really dull investigative drama about Gregory Peck investigating all these things about whether his son can really be the son of the devil or not. So for me, that's much more drama than horror. The Exorcist is a little bit better. The Exorcist does have more horrific scenes in there but that's still a lot about the drama and there's a lot about the um ellen burstein character being really worried about her daughter and her daughter's safety it was sort of like that big like horror film that actually put like the family into jeopardy with the um child being possessed and everything so for me that one plays out a lot like a drama and less like a pure horror film i don't really even like the exorcist that much i mean i respect it but i keep telling lauren to find more lists that have the shining <laughs> in them. And the what about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre then? Like, what uh, what other uh, genre are you going to add in there? I mean, it's been a while since I've seen that. I would have thought Thriller, but it's been a while since I've seen that. But that one actually is coming out to cinemas next month, so I'm going to rewatch that next month. And I can get back to you then if you want. <laughs> well, I think that that's, that's a good point. And that actually brings me over to my next question and what I teased in the intro to that will try to figure out what the hell the distinction is between horror and and thriller because one is meant to uh, induce fear to some extent right but that's essentially the basis of all fear or disgust disorder and thriller is meant to be uh, is telling some kind of suspense and suspense and fear uh, those goes go pretty well in hand i mean building up a scene that you know with a jump scare is essentially building suspense so uh, as Saul mentioned here essentially with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre I mean it is really would essentially be that all slashers to some extent or another would probably be categorized as thrillers uh, and that's the giallo genre as well like giallo is essentially investigative thrillers versus slashers like just uh, coupled together but I, I do think that it, there is this scale it is a pre- issue where you just, you know, okay, this is a horror, but it's also a thriller. Like, yes, you can say that about pretty much anything that builds suspense, but I do think that it makes sense to have like a scale, to, ha- to have a cutoff point. And I think that when you have a film like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is meant to disturb you, it's meant to uh, scare you, it-, it goes beyond the thriller and the thriller is redundant because it's essentially as, like the way I would distinguish thrillers from horror is essentially that the degree of suspense. Does that suspense go up to the level of fear or horror? Like, I, mean, I know that's almost a circular argument. Like, it does the, does the horror from horror. Uh, it, it's not the best argument. I, I recognize that. But essentially, the, that there's that lever that just gets pulled between. Do I feel like I'm in a sense of suspense? Am I engaged? Uh, am I a bit worried? I'm a little bit unsettled to, oh, wow, this is uh, this is really, really uh, worrying. Uh, so Sol is asking, why not both? But why both? Like, then the, then the thriller is irrelevant. If horror is about a degree of suspense that's more horrifying than thriller, then every single horror movie, no matter what, is a thriller. Horror induces suspense at a very heightened level. Therefore, all horror films would be thrillers. That Therefore, there's no reason for horror to really exist as a genre you could just be called scarier thrillers so like like, that that would be my argument i think i'd like to answer on that one chris because i think thriller is actually my favorite genre you know i really actually don't like the concept of genre similar similarly to soul but i tend to notice when i look at lists of favorite thrillers that i've seen all the movies on the lists there must be something subconscious where I am sort of drawn to and, and watching all of these movies that are labelled as thrillers. So I think I probably, you know, not really being a, a horror fan, I I do sort of draw a, a distinction. And maybe it goes back to this, this net loss thing for me that I don't really think that that's what a thriller is about. You know, I think thrillers tend to end on a positive note. You know, maybe you've, you, you know, you've stumbled across a sort of nest of bright nazis in 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 south america or something and at the end of the movie they've all been rounded up and you you know there's a sort of whilst bad things are happening 
throughout the movie and scary things are happening they tend to be less realized you know you tend to be sort of escaping from Leatherface more than you and end up being sort of shot pieces by Le- Leatherface so maybe they're more positive and also just quickly on note about Texas Chainsaw Massacre like I think it's a very good pick as a pure horror although I, I can recall a comic comic scene within Texas Chainsaw Massacre so I think it's when they're they're all sat at the the family table essentially there's one character who I think is like the granddaddy or this sort of great grandpappy or whatever you know just he's he's a guy who's so old that he almost looks like a fossil they've got a victim there for him and you know they're trying to give him the the honor of being able to murder this victim but he he's so weak that he can you know hardly pick up a, a fork let, let alone kill anyone i thought it was a huge moment of dark comedy and i think that was probably intentional as well so maybe that's a you know a very minor flaw in the thesis that texas chainsaw massacre is a pure horror movie but i being someone that is so invested in in thriller and particularly invested in in horror to be honest I do draw lines between them and I think maybe related to this net loss, net, net gain thing that I'm talking about. I think it's quite interesting that you said that you think that thrillers and on a more positive note than horror films because I wouldn't have used that as a definition myself. For me, thrillers are about the edgier seat stuff, about something always happening or having a constant fear of something. So if there's constant dread lingering through a film, it can be a slow burn thriller. Like the original Alien, the Ridley Scott film, is a great example of a slow burn thriller. There isn't a lot of stuff happening in there for the first, I can't remember, 20 or 30 minutes, but it's just like the dread building up. So that for me is a thriller or something where something always is constantly happening. Uh, uh, that to me is a thriller. Whereas I guess a film can be a horror film if if it's more slowly paced and it doesn't have all that lingering dread the entire way through like something like i'm thinking of um martin the uh, george romero film about the guy who thinks he's a vampire that's got horror in there but i don't think from memory that one's actually paced like a thriller it's more of a meditative movie that's got those horror elements in there but like matt said I'm not really, I'm actually really getting over this whole genre distinction because that's the one conclusion I'm jumping to towards the end of this episode is, yeah, I just would love to get rid of genres altogether, except for the fact that if somebody describes something as a really good horror film, that is always going to pique my interest. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I watched Martin recently. I actually do think that that's a movie that, contrary to this sort of image I've, I've been sort of constructing myself during this podcast, someone that's unfazed by movies. The, the sort of, the, the opening scene of, of Martin where this sort of, murder on on a train I, I won't spoil it for people too 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 much but i i think that was genuinely something that i found sort of sick to my soul and i really found that um very traumatizing and i i, I still sort of think of that scene quite often I, I couldn't actually finish the film in the end i mean i think your realization of it as the rest of it from what i saw as meditative and and slower is is right i think actually though like on this concept of the what's the difference between a thriller and a horror I just wanted to bring up Speak No Evil again because that Googled sort of, you know, list of great thrillers and Speak No Evil has already sort of started to list of top thrillers. And it is something like you say where I think it's about the sort of relentless tension, you, you know, that a thriller maintains that level of tension throughout. Whereas a, 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 actually one of the things that I find like annoying about horror movies is it's almost kind of, kind of counterintuitive that I fall asleep during movies quite a fair bit you know particularly if i'm sort of starting them late but horror movies are the absolute epitome of that it's almost always horror movies that i fall asleep to particularly dario argento movies where they have lots of sort of long atmospheric uh, scenes and you you would think a whole genre that's meant to be nerve jangling essentially wouldn't send send people to sleep but i almost invariably fall asleep when i'm watching horror movies so but perhaps there there is something to that but 
Speak No Evil is a horror movie and it is a thriller movie and I think it's probably a good case study and you know without wanting to sort of ruin the movie for people so I, I can't really go into detail Speak No Evil there, there does feel like there's a relentless tension and we are shown things that are absolutely terrifying there is some sort of sense of a permanent loss but I, it's actually probably within the exact framing of the film it's in that gang film in that if you start at the start of the movie and end at the end of the movie it's in that gang you know if you think about events that happened before the start of the movie it definitely is a sort of net loss so good movie to pick because it's out in the cinemas at the moment I don't, and we can't sort of discuss it at length you, you know if people watch that one it might be very explanatory for sort of what each of these genres are meant to be I think uh, the the difference between thrillers and horror to me is like a combination of things. I can't remember who it was. Someone brought up like dread and stuff, but I, I associate dread, like lingering dread with horror, not thriller. But I find like thrillers tend to be more real. Like there's less, there's usually less supernatural elements. There's usually more human drama or like a human villain. And I think that it's um like ho- horror tends to play with the genre and make its horrorness part of it. Like it's either a love letter to horror or it's being subversive to horror. And it's I think thriller tries to to be more visceral without bringing attention to its genre. If that makes sense. So just to be clear, Lauren, you do think that there is an exact split between thriller and horror, so rather there is there is a clear distinctive split that separates the two. It's not the case that essentially every horror film is also a thriller to, to some extent or another. No, I mean, a, f- a film can be a horror and a thriller, and there's lots of films that I think are thrillers that people call horror, but I think they are different. Um, like, I think a movie that, it, there's, if a movie isn't a horror thriller, it's just a thriller, I'm probably not also going to call that a horror. Like, if it's labeled like that on IMDb or, or whatever, but I could see an argument for a horror film being also called a thriller. That, I don't know if that makes any sense. No, no, of course. I mean, I think that the, the other genre in itself is pretty much a horror and thriller merged into one. So I, I, there's thousands of overlaps. I just think that the, those overlaps are films that kind of are in the in-between line between horror and thriller rather than uh, being impossible to separate the two. So I was expressing disbelief that I've, I've fallen asleep through movies like um, A Suspiria before. He's sort of expressing this disbelief in the chat. I actually like it so bad that a movie of Argento's that I really quite like, the Stendhal Syndrome, I think I fell asleep 15 times watching that movie. Like there was 15 separate watches where I just couldn't make it to the end of the movie. And I even like comically decided I'm just going to watch this before lunch on a Sunday. So you know that I'm pretty rested and wide awake and I still fell asleep and actually uh, I did get to the end of it on something like 16th view but yeah I, I fell asleep about 15 times there are particular horror movies that I find incredibly soporific and that's one of them well, well this might be a different episode in its own why Matt falls asleep to horror movies but uh, do you want to take a gander and explain just what it is about these horror movies that uh, puts you asleep I mean, I think, think it does speak to this sort of difference between a thriller and a horror, because I can't ever remember having fallen asleep to a thriller. And, um, you know, I remember Zodiac, for example, I actually, you know, I thought, oh, this is going to be a very chaotic sort of attempt at a film watch. I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to start watching Zodiac at midnight. And, you know, what's the chances of remaining awake when you start watching at midnight? But I was literally sat on the edge of my bed watching that to, to the very end. And it's fairly sort of long move. And I think the thing with a lot of horror movies is that they are elongated periods during most horror movies where nothing is happening. And it's it's more of a sort of a trying to almost evoke a, like a magical atmosphere. They're all, they're often you see a lot of scenes that are set at night time as well. And I just will fall asleep. I think they're almost trying to sometimes filmmakers lull you into a sort of sleepy place before then, you know, some sort of horrible spider comes and eats you or or something. But yeah, I definitely (laughs) uh, fall. I do. It is a big differentiator between two genres for me is whether I'm going to be falling asleep or not. And I apologize to everyone who sort of loves horror and is listening to his podcast because they love horror. And I'm just sort of, oh, yeah, these are the films that make me fall asleep. I, I can see some absolute eruptions in the chat at what I'm saying. Well, I'm not really somebody who falls asleep during films. 
I mean, I'd have to be extremely tired. I mean, when I was younger, um, like in my teenage years after school, I tried to watch something. Sometimes I would fall asleep, but generally I'm not somebody who falls asleep during films. And I guess the thing about Argento, and especially Suspiria, it's just such an audio-visual film that I can't imagine falling asleep with it. I mean, with some Jarlow films, I can't imagine it, because a lot of Jarlow, to me, even though it gets classified as thriller, I see it more as crime drama. I guess something like maybe Cat O' Nine Tales, maybe something like that, a bit more drama, crime. So that one I can sort of imagine falling asleep to, but just Suspiria, it's got just such bright and intense colours. It's got that pounding goblin music score. Uh, I just can't imagine falling asleep to that. And then Stendhal Syndrome, I mean, it just breaks my heart, you know, because I, I love Vertigo, and to me that's the uh, best Vertigo homage pretty much ever made. That, that film really blew my mind the first time I saw it. So it, it would be interesting to do a podcast on falling asleep during films, what films make us fall asleep, whether we fall asleep or not. Maybe we can schedule that for a little bit later on in the year. I do really love the Stendhal syndrome, but by the way, you know, I said I've said that I've fallen asleep during it fifteen times, but you, you know, the the fifteen times is the it's the bit to to pay attention to. You know, I enjoy the movie, and you know, I want it to the end of it. And I guess maybe the word that I'm looking for, the unlocking sort of magic word, is hypnosis. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the movies can be hypnotic, which is why I fall asleep. So even when you're talking about the Goblin score for spirit you know i think that goblin score is profoundly hypnotic at least that was the effect on me you know a lot of these have been sort of home movies watches and you know it's easier to fall asleep at home i've also fallen asleep watching suspiria in the cinema wow. I've, I've, I've fallen asleep to the remake of suspiria as well you had a chance to save yourself there and say you just fell asleep <laughs> in the remake but no both of them <laughs> I do love this, how many future episode ideas were coming uh, up right in this episode. And uh, I feel like for, for an episode where we're almost two hours in to try to figure out what the hell horror is, we haven't really managed without uh, saying, essentially we're saying, maybe we should abolish genres. <laughs> um, it might be this, it might be this other thing, it might be scary, it might be tit titillating, it might have something to do with loss. We throw out a lot of things, none of us really agree. Um, it's even a question if such a thing as a pure horror film can even exist with at least one person saying, nah -ah -ah. So, <laughs> it's a very, very uh, fascinating episode here. I think maybe then, since, since we're so lost, uh, and since uh, Matt has already offended a lot of horror fans uh, already, and uh, maybe it would be good to uh, offend people some more, and uh, end with uh, my final, more controversial question, and hopefully we haven't put most people asleep at this point. Uh, and in that case, maybe they'll wake up hearing some of the rumblings that are uh, going to come up. But I I'd love to just ask all of you whether there are any big horror films you know, ranging from big classics to recent hits that you don't actually see as horror and the soul is snuck it out there that it doesn't really see the omen as proper horror. So uh, what other ways are we going to find to uh, offend our listeners today? So I think I, I can come up with an example of that. And I, I mean, I think this speaks to how personal horror is. I mean, I said in the chat yesterday, I think that to some extent, whether you're going to be terrified by arachnophobia relies on whether you're actually scared of spiders or, or not. You know, if, if you are scared of spiders, that movie is going to be the most terrifying movie that you ever watch. And so an example of a movie that some people would just see as a comedy is The Exorcist. And... You, you know, I hope I haven't sort of horrified too many people by sort of bringing that one up. But I do think that to be horrified by The Exorcist, it really does help to be Catholic. You know, if you're not Catholic, if you're not even super superstitious, or if you are like a hardcore atheist, like if you are a really hardcore sort of honest sort of atheist, what you know, watching. Watching The Exorcist it is watching sort of comedy, you know, especially when it gets extremely supernatural. And I guess the point here is that if you're defining horror by, you know, are a lot of people scared by it, then obviously it's a, it's a horror movie. But if we're sort of thinking of it in a different sense as the movie doesn't happen on the screen, it happens in, in your head. 
No, I think certainly the Exorcist could, you know, not have any horror element in it at all. You know, it could just be a, a, a comedy for some people. Is that the number one movie on TSZDT that I'm taking down? So apologies for that. I mean, maybe that's why I'm on the podcast is to, you know, bring in this sort of shocking non-horror maven sort of point of view. But I think that The Exorcist could just simply be considered comedy. Well, I wouldn't go as far as to call The Exorcist a comedy, but like I said before, with The Exorcist and The Omen, really big 70s horror films, it's really different from what we consider these days to be horror films because, to me, they're more investigative dramas rather than horror films per se. I don't know if these would be my picks, but just a couple of films that are towards the top of They Shoot Zombies that we haven't discussed yet, they get debated. There's always a lot of debate about whether The Science of the Lambs is a horror movie or not. And whoever does updates on TMDB, the genres there keep changing. So every so often, Science of the Lambs will be getting added to the letterboxed list of highest rated horrors. Then it gets removed, then it's added on again, then it gets removed again. So that's one that gets debated and thrown around a lot is The Science of the Lamb, a horror film. Is it the only horror film that's won the Best Picture Oscar? Or is it actually a thriller and not a horror film? And then the other one is Jaws, because Jaws, it's not a horror film on IMDb. Whenever it gets changed to a horror film, somebody goes in and corrects it and changes it to a thriller. But, yeah, I guess for me, I don't really mind either way. I mean, to me, both of those films play out more like horror films than The Omen, The Exorcist does. The Silence of the Lambs, I guess, possibly to me is more thriller than horror though a lot of it is about Jodie Foster being so scared and everything and stuff in her past coming back to haunt her. Jaws to me I'd say is probably more definitely a horror film. I think the argument that's sort of made is that it's about the animal attacking so it's not really about a monster attacking per se and then it's sort of like well is it about the animal attacking or is it you know this poor creature who's actually not as intelligent as human beings doesn't actually realize the chaos and havoc that's that it's causing and then jaws is also quite a bit of solid drama in there so i guess to me it's got a lot of drama in but look i don't mind either of those films being in a horror list myself i haven't actually gone and looked at all the other TSZDT films. Uh, I might do in a moment and find some other ones. But it's like towards the low end, some other films that also get chucked in there, which sort of annoy me, is like Rear Window gets chucked in sometimes towards the bottom of the They Shoot uh, Zombies canon. And I guess to me, that's much more thriller than horror. I mean, I know it's about a murderer, but I don't know if every film about a murderer is necessarily a horror film. And then Vertigo sometimes also makes it towards the end of uh, the They Shoot Zombies canon. And Vertigo to me, I mean, yeah, I guess you could debate it because, like, it's a lot about the being scared of heights and whatever and about this woman, like, really coming back from the past and whatever, coming back from the dead. But to me, like, Vertigo is not a horror film. And I think it was another one also. There's something else which also sometimes keeps popping up towards the end of They Shoot Zombies, which really annoys me. But, um, yeah, I know it's hard for Lauren with the algorithms and trying to, like, exclude films altogether. Uh, she reckons the sound of music comes up there. Uh, that's interesting because I did actually see that recently for the first time. Oh, only two oh, people vote on it. Okay. Oh, well, it's like, well, 27 dresses also. I think at one stage it was in the 1001 to 2000 range because somebody had it on there as their highest rated horror film or just because horror is so subjective based on what people think is scary. But, you know, uh, I would love to see The Father, as I mentioned at, towards the start of the podcast episode, I'd love to see The Father reclassified as a horror film because to me that's probably the scariest film that I've seen that's been made in the 2020s so far. So I think so. V Vertigo is definitely in that lost movie. And to me, when I think about Vertigo, it's an existential horror, you know, like I think you mentioned that is playing on falling off buildings. But to me, it's a horror movie about the male gaze. And I think these sort of mass movies that everyone has seen, I think the important thing to talk about is, is the effect of them. And so you mentioned Jaws. Jaws made a whole generation of people frightened to go in the water. I remember being terrified to go in the sea for, you know, decades after watching Jaws. And, you know, I live in the UK, so the odds of a shark attack happening in the UK are basically zero. 
but I also think like you know I mentioned the Exorcist, and I was very rudely probably for a lot of the audience listening to the podcast or dismissing it as, as a comedy but I do actually remember w- watching a documentary about William Friedkin making The Sorcerer so I, for- I forget exactly where he did this so it's it's kind of a movie from the same source as The, the Wages of Fear you know it's a great movie The Sorcerer I do remember the the anecdote that wherever he was shooting this I think it was somewhere in Central America when the locals found out that Freakin was the director of The Exorcist, there was actually a huge sort of problem because the locals there had gone to see The Exorcist and they hadn't seen it as, you know, this is something with actors and sets and lighting. They had almost seen it as, you know, someone is recording actual supernatural acts and has su- supernatural capabilities. So there was almost a, a huge incident on, on the set of that movie. And that just speaks to the sort of mass horror effect that movie had in, in that part of the world. I don't have anything to comment specifically on that, but I will echo genre definitions of Rio Window and Vertigo. They're ones that really annoy me that keep slipping into they shoot zombies because I think they're thrillers. A couple others that I wanted to add, like Psycho, I don't consider a horror movie. I think that's a thriller. Uh, so it, I think I'd put it on my best, on my favorite horror movies list, but it annoys me because I don't think it's a horror movie. But it's like if I don't put it in there, then it doesn't make <laughs> sense. I also don't really think Night of the Hunter is a horror movie. I think that is thriller. Some others that pop up, like Hard Candy, it's not super high in the list, but that's not a horror film to me. I can't speak French, but <laughs> Les Diabolik, I think that that's a pure thriller. Sol says he loves Night of the Hunter and says horror. I hate Night of the Hunter and I say thriller. And also like Shutter Island, I think that's a mystery thriller. There's so many of them that slip in, especially in the lower parts of the list. And even like um, we mentioned witches before, I actually ended up removing a bunch of witch lists that I'd added because when I look back through them, you know, they were introduced as here's some scary movies about witches rather than here's some horror films with witches. And a lot of the films they included were like films that clearly weren't horror or intending to be horror or like anything. So, you know, sometimes I have to like I'm usually not. To, like I'm picky with lists, but I'm not super picky. And that if like if someone's definition of horror isn't the same as mine, that's not uh, that's not a reason to exclude it. But sometimes um, people make really stupid choices. And like Sol mentioned, Twenty Seven Dresses and Sound of Music, and I think that was just people trying to be funny. But they were from voters who like you know h- high quality voters and high quality lists, except for that one stupid movie they included. So they end up in there somewhere. Sorry to interrupt you, Lauren, but, I, you know, I found some the list of movies that you sort of brought together there I found really interesting because I think several of the movies that you mentioned, realising that they're not horror movies is a plot twist. So, you know, sev- several of those movies, like, you know, you mentioned Lady Diabolique and you mentioned Psycho. You're going through most of those movies thinking, I'm watching a horror movie. And one of my favorite movies is The the Burning Room by Duvivier is, is another one where you think that you're watching a horror movie, but you're actually not. And I think that is a, that is a whole subgenre of films. But then the legitimacy question is still open. If a movie wears horror movie clothes for the rest of it, but then the twist is that it's not actually a horror movie, is there? should that be voted on and part, part of that polling process. Uh, uh, how does that work? Like, how, how is it possible that, you know, you think it's a horror, but then suddenly uh, towards the end, the twist is it's not horror? Well, I mean, I, I guess it's okay to talk about these movies and introduce spoilers. You know, if anyone hasn't seen any of these very famous movies, you know, then maybe sort of s- skip a little bit of the, the podcast. But I think the idea with Le Diabolique uh, is that one of the characters is trying to convince another character that he's sort of dead and that he's come back to life, right? And that, that he's absolutely a ghost. And then that has a terrifying effect. But it is all a, a trick. It's a it's a charade, and you you know I think the idea with Psycho, for example, is that you're meant to believe that you know his his mum is sort of still alive in some sort of shape or form. That you know maybe she's a ghost or or, or some something like that. 
I mean, I think th those are fairly sort of normal readings of the, the movies. I hope I'm not sort of being unusual, but I think quite a few of those movies that you mentioned, you don't know the first time you watch it, you know, and if no one's spoken to you about it, that, that they do feel like horror movies. You know, they feel like they have elements of supernatural horror to them until you find out that they don't. Ah, I got you. I mean, I would still say Psycho is horror, but I mean, Psycho is essentially a film that masquerades as a thriller drama and then becomes a horror. But that's how I would describe it. But uh, no, I, I get your point in that case if you look at it from a supernatural perspective. I mean, it's not a supernatural movie, right? A lot of the running time, Norman Bates, you're not aware that he's, he's the murderer, right? The setup is deliberately ambiguous, and then it's it's a kind of plot twist that he's, he's dressing up as his mum, right? Unless I've gone mad, you know, frequently. <laughs> you do feel <laughs> that I've gone mad, but I, no, I no, think I mean, it's that meant to twist, come off. That is the, that this is the plot twist to a horror movie, in my mind. Though, to be honest, I mean, having seen Cycle several times, it never even occurred to me to think that uh, Hitchcock wanted you to believe that the mother was a ghost. So uh, that, that's a really interesting reading of uh, the film. It would be uh, really fun to hear if any of our listeners uh, thought the same while they were watching Psycho. Do, do let us know. But uh, <laughs> in terms of the films uh, on the top of the list that I wouldn't uh, think qualifies as horror, uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion you guys had on Jaws, that, in that it was it's never really been categorized as horror on IMDb. Because when we, at the very beginning of this episode, when we talked about the films that actually scared us, uh, I think Jaws was the one I really remembered uh, having an impact. But uh, of course, like a large portion of Jaws is not a traditional horror movie either so i get why that would be like an in-between case but it, it's easily one of the most horrifying films out there and, and i will actually agree with Saul that the father probably should be categorized as horror it's a very 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 unsettling film uh, I, I, oh, going back to like the most obvious controversial case there uh, would would be Silence of the Lambs. Uh, Saul says he considers more of a horror. I never really have. I mean, looking at IMDb, like the, the genres are police procedural, uh, psychological drama, psychological thriller, serial killer, crime drama thriller. I, I just always saw this as a more very, very standard traditional thriller. I never saw it as a horror movie. And uh, I can barely see how it fits. Like, there, there's some more scary scenes in there, but... Like, on the scale, especially in the perspective of the 90s, uh, I, I don't think that really qualifies. But that is the thing, though. Like, if you go back to the 30s, uh, like, what qualifies as horror? Like, films like Dracula, etc. People were passing out in the cinema when they were watching them. But those also have fairly long build-ups with a lot of dialogue, etc. Like, they're almost more horror dramas. <laughs> like, I do consider Dracula horror. But like, like it's interesting just how times change in terms of what we see as horror as well. I mean, uh, as well, I think was Saul mentioned Freaks in the... Uh, yes, Saul mentioned Freaks in the chat. That is horror. I agree with that. But I mean, in the 30s, people were scared. It's just interesting to see just how societal changes affect uh, what we see as horror as well. I mean, there are some other films in the top 100 that I don't think are horror. One that's probably not controversial at all would be Seven. That's not marked as horror anywhere. That's just a thriller to me. I don't know why that's so frequently listed there. Uh, the Vanishing is another film on the top 100 that I don't see as horror at all. That's another pure thriller. And I'll also throw in Ice Without a Face. Very atmospheric, very unsettling, but I, I never really saw that as a horror film either. So th those would be my picks from the top 100 of Days with Zombies. I, I don't think those are overly controversial, but if they are, feel free to, you know, uh, rip me a new one on the ICM forum. Uh, tell me I'm wrong. I, I think you're wrong about freaks. <laughs> so I just jump in there str straight away. And I mean, I, I'm being so naughty here because I, you know, haven't watched freaks, but, you know, I've seen a lot of stills from it. So I get the general idea. And I think. You know, I talked about the concept of the abject b before, uh, you know, which I think is something that you're probably not going to get in a thriller. You know, the thriller is not about the abject. It's not about confronting the, these things that uh, you really find hard to confront. And I think I have to be very careful talking about the movie because obviously it, it contains a lot of people who have very different types of bodies. And that's not inherently horrifying 
to some people it could be that you, you know that would be very interesting to, to see the variety of humans out there but i have met a number of people in my life who they would have a phobia of dealing with differently abled people you know they'd have a phobia of having conversa- conversation with someone with with down syndrome for example but i think that is a lot of what the movie freaks that I'm, i imagine is is playing on it is you you know you have all these people with very different sort of bodies and mental capabilities and a lot of people would find that abject you know a lot of people wouldn't but i imagine that's that's why it's it's ending up in a list like this yeah that's a good point and that's definitely how it was seen at the time and i mean it reminds me of uh this is actually classified as a horror as well. Uh, Multiple Maniacs by John Waters, which has this uh, opening scene, I think, if I recall correctly, it's been ages since I saw it, which is like a carnival of the disgusting or the strange or the bizarre, or like something like that. And one of the acts uh, is like just two men kissing. And that, that's meant to uh, just shock and scare people. Now, obviously, John Waters is a gay filmmaker and he's uh, doing this to point satirically, but like it, it brings to mind a very similar thing. I think that Kim Newman quote from from earlier was key about you know how horror movies sort of changed you know from the 30s you know they were like before you know and I I do think an issue with this is that I see sort of humans as a a very rapidly evolving species you know maybe not genetically rapid but i think in terms of how people think uh, every decade people are thinking in a completely different way you know this probably wasn't the case for most of human history but i think almost every 10 years now there's so much exchange of ideas that almost the the sort of starting point for where humans are is so different the way we see the world and the way we interact with the world is so different even 10 years ago definitely 100 years ago so i think that that is an issue with this that we're discussing movies often that were made when when humans were were very different in major ways that's a really poignant uh, point matt and maybe this will be a third or fourth idea in presenting this episode <laughs> that we'll, we'll come back to in a future episode because that's like how have our perception of uh, genres films what films are uh, how we view them just changed decade to decade to decade or from 100 years ago to now that that is a really really interesting topic to dive into as well so i I think uh, everyone who's in this episode has gotten some extra ideas to think about as some possible spoilers of where this podcast will go in the future Uh, do let us know in the icm forum like which of these ideas you're most interested in hearing more about do let us know which horror films you don't think are actually horror films and do let us know like to what extent do you think we completely dropped the ball? Because after two hours of talking, we still haven't figured out what exactly horror is. So if you have a definition you're happy with, just go to the ICM forum, post it there and start the debate. And uh, with that, thank you so much for listening and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com.